So we start with you, Mr. Pollard. We now invite you to ask your questions for candidates Dill and Hink. And you can start with whichever one you want. Can you speak up? Because that is not an amplified mic. Sure, I will speak up. Um, given that there will be a three-way race, oh, this is the old version. Okay. Um, sorry. Is this, uh, who is this for? Senator Bill, and I revised okay. it slightly. All right. It's okay. Uh, given that there will be a three-way race for the Senate seat, will you please describe which of your views, that, any views that you believe will appeal to independent and Republican voters? Um, I don't hope to appeal necessarily to Republican voters at all. Um, although I do have a number of Republican supporters who, who vote for me in my um, election in Senate District 7. But um, it may be a three-way race, and I think it's incredibly important that there's a strong progressive Democrat on the ballot because the independent is going to set the goalpost somewhere in the center, and we know that the Republican candidate will be to the right. And unless we have somebody who's willing to stand up for the values of progressives in this community, our conversation will just shift. And I think that I'm the person for the job because, first of all, I have a record of success in the election. I am very uh, clear on where I stand. I think that I have um, a very progressive record in terms of um, civil rights, in terms of economic uh, diversity. I proposed uh, expanding and was successful in um, sponsoring legislation that led to a high-speed internet network of 1,100 miles in rural Maine. Um, I think that I am uh, competent to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Angus King on some of the positions that he's taken, for instance, he vetoed a minimum wage law. He vetoed a law to, um, to not, uh, expand the family medical leave. He um, sponsored, spearheaded legislation that threw a number of severely injured workers off of workers' comp. And he left the state with over $1.2 billion in deficit. And I am perfectly comfortable um, having a campaign that looks forward. The tagline of my campaign is it's time for a new generation of leadership in Washington. And I think I'm a candidate that can best articulate that vision. Thank you. Time, time is up. And you have another question for Mr. Hink? I do, and I'm going to ask you the same question. And, and I, I did learn, actually, if I, if I skill a lot, I will use it that the Hancock County Democrat, its fellow Jim Schatz, told me how to make a statement into a question. So I'll modify it somewhat. Remember that? that Please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm up front. So <laughs> <laughs> he ended it by saying, what is it? Don't you agree? Don't you agree? Don't you agree? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, we've done that in my committee too. So, so <laughs> I believe, you know, I would posit that our state is incredibly divided between the different political perspectives, and that to defeat Governor King and the Republican nominee in the general election, we will need a Democratic nominee who can appeal to independent voters who are a larger group than Democrats or Republicans, I mean. Um, whether you appeal to Republicans or not, it's up to you, but can you please describe how your views will appeal to independent or possibly as well as Republican voters? Um, you know, the, the fact is that the views, by the way, I should thank you for the question, Ben. Um, the views that I have uh, accord well with the interests, including the economic interests, but other issue, interests of the ordinary working man. I think sometimes the nature of the debate in the United States and here in Maine uh, makes it hard for people to, uh, to see that. Uh, I think we have people who are promoting, for example, regress of taxation, and they manage to convince working people that it's in their interest to support that. I would like to see that uh, those issues come out in the general election. Uh, Angus King... Uh, in my view, is like electoral comfort food. <laughs> we know him, a little bit bland, but uh, a, a smart man and, and a thinker. Uh, he's had his chance to push major reform, and he didn't seize it. Our country is facing great, a great number of challenges, and our U.S. Senate is getting less done than it ever has in my lifespan. Sending mac and cheese <laughs> down to Washington is not good enough. We need somebody who's willing to accept those challenges, take them on, and work real hard to get it done. I would do that. Okay, now moving on to candidate Dunlap. Please ask your questions of 
Is it also is it the Adil and John Hank? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we've, we've had a, a chance tonight to talk a little bit about the rule of law, and I'm not an attorney, um, but we do have two attorneys who are running for this nomination. And given the pivotal role of the United States Senate in confirming justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, my question actually to both uh, Cynthia Dill and John Hink is which Supreme Court justice would you like to see, most like to see replaced and why? Mm -hmm. so, Ms. Dill, would you like to start? I would like to see um, Samuel Alito replaced. <laughs> why? And why? Because, um, first of all, I think the confirmation of him was a um, uh, poor example of how judicial confirmation should be handled. Um, and because of his record of voting to restrict uh, the civil rights of Americans, including um, a woman's right to choose, um, I. I mean, I could cite some cases, but I just think, I mean, it's a difficult question, but in my, in my view, I would like to replace Samuel Alito with um, someone along the lines of Sonia Sotomayor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, those are more um, justices who align with my values, and I believe that since um, the courts make up with Justices Alito and Scalia, um, and even Chief Justice Roberts, uh, unfortunately, the decisions, the Citizens United case is an example of a very controversial decision that's done significant harm to this country by injecting large sums of money into the political process. And I would just note that earlier when I said that President Obama should accept money from super PACs, my feeling is that those are the rules of the game and he should play by the same rules, but that doesn't mean that you can't fight to change the rules. And so I actually think that if the Supreme Court votes to uh, repeal the Affordable Care Act, that as a United States Senator, what we could do is increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hank, your response. Uh, I have to overcome a, a lawyerly instinct to be careful when commenting on any judges who could possibly sit on my cases. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually had a case, the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill, that went up to the Supreme Court uh, we had won a five billion dollar judgment in the trial level, and it was brought down to five hundred thousand by the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, in many ways, I can't imagine things going worse. So I'm going to swing for the fences. Change the Chief Justice. John Roberts should go. Uh, I think that John Roberts was not upfront when he testified in his nomination. He said, with another sports analogy, baseball analogy, that uh, judges are only umpires. They just call the balls and strikes as they see them. He did not do that in the Citizens United case. He didn't do that in Bush v. Gore. I'm looking really closely at the Affordable Care Act case. But let's take Citizens United. That case made up law. Uh, we had a court, the Supreme Court back in the 1890s, the case was uh, Santa Clara Railway, that decided that uh, corporations were per people under the law, persons under the law. That was not done by statute, that was not in the Constitution, that was made up. And they doubled down in Citizens United. They obviously weren't comfortable with it because they hardly talked about corporations in that de decision. They talked about um, disadvantaged speakers. And they were referring to General Motors and uh, Exxon Mobil. Looks like my time is up. Oh. Chief Justice Roberts should go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, moving on to uh, candidate Dill, please ask your questions for Ben Pollard and Matt Dunn. Do I have to do I have to use the questions that I that I sent in? <laughs> Up to you. Um, you can stick to those two people. Okay, sure. Um, my first question is to. Um, Matt Dunlap, I was going to ask you if you supported a feasibility study of the Maine Woods National Park, um, which included the proposed gift of 70,000 acres and $40 million um, from Roxanne Quimby, um, and as a senator, whether or not you would vote to uh, support that feasibility study. But now I'm thinking of asking you instead how it is that you baited a bear to make a bear blanket. Well, um, I'll answer the second question since that's the one that you're asking me. I, I, when I was chair of the Fish and Wildlife Committee, we 
had a fair amount of controversy around the practice of the bear hunting, and I hunt. I had never done it before, and so I decided to find out what it was all about myself. And over the course of several years, I worked with a group of people that I hunt with, and we set up a place near uh, in Alton, here by Old Town. And we spent three years trying different types of uh, different types of baits. And uh, it was three years before we saw one. So uh, one of the questions that I wanted to answer was, is it as hard, is it as easy as the opponents say it is? And I discovered the answer to that was no. Uh, how I wound up with the blanket was we did a further uh, study of, of that particular practices by working with a fellow who was working with a museum to procure specimens for students. And they were looking for some, uh, a bear specimen. So I spent several months doing uh, scientific documentation on a, on a bear bait site, and we were successful. And that's how I wound up with that. And Ms. Dill, can you have your question for Mr. Pollard? Yes, my question for Mr. Pollard is, um, you have stated publicly that you don't believe employers who provide health insurance should be compelled to include contraception, even though this prescription is often used to treat health care uh, treat medical conditions and reduces the cost of health care and reduces unwanted pregnancies. Do you also believe that employers should be able to deny coverage for Viagra and drugs used to treat erectile dysfunction? So this actually brings up an important point. I, I believe I am the most electable Democrat here on the stage because I have views with cross-party lines. And my opposition to the Affordable Care Act, straying a bit from the question, uh, is shared by many, I would say most mayors actually, especially the Republicans and Independents, who I do plan to appeal to people across the entire political spectrum. And I think it's the reason why Scott Brown won the Senate race in Massachusetts, and I believe it's the reason why the Republicans retook the House and, and regained seats in the Senate. I think the issue of contraception, unfortunately, is kind of twisted in the political arena because I'm not opposed to contraception. In fact, I'm in favor of contraception. I think it's great for family planning, and I think people should use it. I, I'm also in favor of religious freedom, and I think we really need to be very careful about the role of the federal government in impeding the rights of religious organizations to make choices that they believe are moral. And so what I believe is if, if it's an organization such as the Catholic Church, which runs hospitals or universities that we should be very careful, and I'm not in favor of a federal mandate that they would be required to provide a service to which they are opposed. I do think Catholics, both who've left the church or who are in the church, who believe the Catholic Church should reform its position on contraception, should be vocal and active. But I think I share views of many mayors who are libertarians who are very conscientious of the slippery slope of the federal government being on for living and individual liberties. Now, moving on to um, Mr. Hink. Can you please ask your questions for Mr. Pollard and Mr. Bell? This question is for Matt Delman. He's probably already prepared for it. <laughs> we'll see. In 2006, I introduced a bill in the 123rd Maine Legislature that would have instituted instant runoff or ranked choice voting as it sometimes called for gubernatorial elections in Maine. As Secretary of State, you opposed my bill, citing what appeared to be plainly exaggerated costs and other complaints. If the bill had passed and been enacted, Maine likely would have never elected the current governor, Paul Okay, whether you like that or not. <laughs> he clearly would not have gotten many second place, second choice votes from the third, the candidate who came in third place, Libby Mitchell. My question is, do you have any regrets for opposing positive electoral reform back then and not offering any constructive ideas on how Maine might have been able to move forward with instant runoff of it? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, uh, that particular piece of legislation, which I remember quite vividly, because we talked about it quite a bit at the time, uh, was something I believe was based on some model legislation that had been winding its way around the country. And the costs are not exaggerated. Based on the technology that was being prescribed in the legislation, it would have cost approximately about somewhere around $9 million to implement across the state of Maine. Money that we did not have and was not provide, provided for in the legislation. 
subsequent to the, the defeat of that legislation, because of some of those material concerns for the structural problems of the bill, we did uh, work with Representative Diane Russell and backed a proposal for a pilot project for ranked choice voting. Not truly really instant runoff voting applies electronic voting machines, which were being decertified across the country at the time, which is another strategic problem with, with the legislation. I should also note that uh, Representative Hank never spoke to me about the text of the bill before he submitted it. So we had no opportunity to help him improve the text of the bill. Uh, the freshman error. Uh, <laughs> which would give you a pass to the freshman error. Uh, the ranked choice voting bill, the, the pilot project, was also not successful, unfortunately. But we were very, I was very pleased to see what happened here in Portland in the oral election. I think that is a good pathway to have some type of mechanism so that people's voices can be recorded as they intended on a ballot. So I, I'm not opposed to ranked choice voting or, or runoff voting, uh, but the, the structure has to be meaningful and recognizable. Thank you. And your last question, Mr. Hinkfell, your oh, last, right. last question of the evening to Mr. Collins. I did have a good one for um, Cynthia, but it wasn't given back to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, go to my, I go to my Ben Pollard <laughs> question. Uh, Let me see. I understand your distaste for the individual mandate that is part of the health care laws now known as Obamacare and Romney Care. Do you agree that we could avoid the individual mandate if the country simply adopted universal single-payer health care, and would you be upfront and vocal in your support of the adoption of such a health care system in America? Thank you for your question, Representative King. Um, I do believe that were we to adopt a nationwide single-payer system, we could achieve universal coverage, or by definition. Um, I would not be vocal in my support because I do believe there is a role for the private health insurance industry. And I have just gotten back from England where there is a hybrid and there is national health for those people who are not able to afford private health insurance. And for those of more means who would like shorter wait or time waiting times, better services, and who can afford private health insurance. Um, but I do think that then that's an option. And, and I do think that the Medicaid and there should be a single payer option for anyone who's not able to afford uh, private health insurance. And I think as much as possible, we should focus on promoting economic prosperity so that individuals can have responsibility for maintaining their own health and lowering health care costs through proper nutrition and regular exercise. Um, and also um, have a single payer option to provide their birth, continue to discuss it for those of limited means. Um, I only have 30 seconds. The last thing I would just like to say in wrapping this up, uh, this is an example of where I feel my views cross party lines. Uh, I'm new to this. I'm not part of the political establishment. I'm learning as I'm going. I'm going to end with a quote from John Lennon. He said, uh, you may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope one day you'll join us in the world for this one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the candidates for coming here. <laughs>